good to be here in the house of the Lord. Let's all stand and sing Emmanuel. <coughs> sing our next song. Uh, just uh, remain standing for our opening prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, it's a great thing that we can come in, in here and lift, lift in here together today and lift your name up on high. That name, Emmanuel, God with us. And we thank you for this Christmas season, Father, and, uh, and everything that you know, it's nice to have the decorations and, and the music and the things that, that get us thinking about Christmas because we realize when we're thinking about Christmas, we're thinking about the miracle of your birth, the miracle of your first coming and what you came here to do for us, Lord. And so we pray that you would just impress upon us the preciousness of this season. Every Sunday is special uh, when we gather together with God's people in the Lord's house, but it, it, is, it is a special season, God, and we just pray that you use all these things that we plan in the body of this service uh, to help us reflect upon what a great thing it is that God came to be with us in the form of Jesus Christ, the Christ child. So we lift up this time to you, Father. May you bless it and pour your spirit out on it. May, it. may we magnify your name in this place here today. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. We're going to sing the first Noel.
it says in our bulletin that uh, here in a moment we're going to have a quick business meeting to a approve our budget. I don't think there's any other uh, stuff that's going to come up in, in, uh, in business, but uh, we will be doing that in a moment. So if uh, you haven't got a chance to check that out and you want to, uh, this would be the time to peruse that uh, real quickly. I just uh, mention a couple of, couple of things. Um, I know we said we'd do it in a minute, but uh, can you just, can I go ahead and get you to say something about Salvation Army? Sure. Uh, don't forget, Salvation Army, the bell ringing is this Thursday tonight, and I think that day is full. Thank you so much for the ones that have signed up. There's a, a few slots left for the 14th, which is the following Tuesday, and we, I certainly appreciate uh, everyone signed up for that, and if you could, uh, what a blessing it is to go out and ring the bell. I think the weather's supposed to be pretty nice, uh, and, and to share the good news of Jesus' birth. So, again, thank you so much, and, and if you would, uh, sign up for Thursday, and that will fill up the slot for those two days. I think there, I just look, there's three slots. Those are uh, one-hour slots, so check it out. See if the one at the time, time's work for you if you have uh, not yet done that. I want to keep in mind that we are now starting uh, for the month of December for our Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. It goes to support the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's one of the most important offerings of the year. They're all important, but of course it's a very important one as we seek to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world, and that goes directly to support missionaries in the field uh, in countries where it's uh, friendly to be a Christian and in countries where uh, they have to be very, very creative because they're in place, they are in places uh, like China or places in the Middle East where it's not as friendly to be Christians, but uh, we may not go there. Yeah, I may not personally ever go to China or ever go to to one of those countries in the Middle East but we're going there uh, through our giving so keep that in mind uh, also know that we have these two uh, OCC warehouse mission trips coming up both are then coming up I guess that would be this week um, one's on December 9th that's our women on mission doing that and the other's on December 10th and that's our youth doing that so if you're interested in the women on mission trip Talk to Ruby Benj. If you're interested in the uh, youth trip, uh, talk to Pastor uh, Caps. Also, did we, so did we start the Christmas card delivery today? Did that start? I was in my office. I didn't see. Did that yeah, start today? Yeah. It did start today. So the Christmas card delivery uh, is off and running, and uh, the money that's saved slash raised for that goes to support uh, Lottie Moon as well. So keep that in mind. I see that the poinsettias are in. Don't they look beautiful? Uh, it really I mean, it definitely brightens up what already is a red room. It just makes it, makes it even prettier. Uh, but if you want to make sure that you get who it's in honor of or memory, uh, talk to Tammy or, or talk to Tracy. That's about all the things I was going to mention as far as announcements go. Am I forgetting anything? Anybody got anything? Crickets, that's all I hear. Okay, sounds good. Well, then we'll go ahead and we'll call, uh, we'll call us into a... Uh, business meeting to approve our budget. Is somebody going to come make the motion? As uh, <clears throat> the pastor mentioned, it is time to approve our budget for the upcoming year of 2022. I did want to mention a, a couple things about the budget. As you can see there, anything that has changed from the previous year is in bold. And also at the bottom of the budget sheet that you have, there are our mission goals for the different offerings. And you can see that we have two different types of offerings. Some offerings are dedicated uh, amounts that are given by the church. And we have offerings for mission goals that have goals, the ones that have the, the amount out to the side of them are the ones that have goals, and the one that the preacher mentioned is the Lottie Moon offering. But also, in addition, within this budget are our quotes for our church, bus, and mowing bids. Those bids were up this year, and those bids are for a two-year cycle. So these bids were, are for 2022 and 2023. So within this budget, you will also be approving the following uh, church maintenance bids. The custodial and building maintenance, the Board of Deacons approved uh, Tammy Griffin for that bid at a cost of $17,400 annually. For the church bus cleaning and maintenance, 
the board approved for Jerry Green uh, to do that bid at a cost of $1,800 annually. And for the loan maintenance, the board approved for Scott Eford to complete that bid at a cost of $9,000 annually. And once again, those bids are for two years, for 2022 and 2023. And those amounts are included in the 2022 budget that you see there that was in the, the church bulletin. So before uh, Pastor Kerry calls for a vote, are there any questions that we can answer about the budget for 2022? All right, so we got a motion on the floor to accept this budget as our, our 2022, and in the process, we're also approving those three bids because they are part of these uh, budgets. It's already been asked if there was any discussion, no questions were asked. It comes from committee, so it doesn't need a second. All in favor of approving this budget, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, the budget passes. Is there any other uh, business that needs to be brought forward to church today? I got a motion to adjourn. We got a second? I got a second. We are adjourned. And what is next? Offertory prayer. Come on down.
All right, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a little different today as far as our our message goes. It's just a little different tact than I than I'll take a lot of times. Uh, we're actually going to look at kind of like jump to three different parts. But for our scripture reading, I want to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter one. And in your pew Bible, that is page eight forty nine. If you're using the pew Bible. I'm not preaching yet. All right, I'll go ahead and do it. Well, I'll, st- I'll flash a flashlight from the back for you, you know, in code. I said, you could do that or you could just yell at me. Either way, it's going to work. So on page 849, your pew Bible, uh, Matthew chapter 1. And this would be our first scripture reading that's, you know, going to bring in a part of the Christmas story. And that's very simply, we're gonna, so we're going to have then four messages that are going to constitute just a very simple title, a series called The Christmas Story. We're going to look at different aspects of the Christmas story and, and why it's so powerful. Uh, one of the greatest stories, you know, if you, if you, I guess you could go with, you know, it's, it's Christmas and Easter. Those are the two greatest. And so, but what, you know, just what are some of the powerful uh, elements of it? And that's what we're going to try to bring out over these four messages. And by the way, that'll be three Sundays. And then that'll also be an Advent uh, service that we're going to do. It's kind of like a Christmas Eve service. It'll be an Advent service on the Wednesday before Christmas. So that's when this series will complete. And we're, we're also going to be in Luke chapter 1. Uh, today, we're, and we're going to also then make a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So a lot of chapter 1s, we're going to bounce around a little bit. But for our scripture reading, we're going to go ahead and start off Matthew chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 18 and then work from there. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her way away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, uh, to take, uh, to take you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took, to, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he, and he called his name Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." We're going to stop there. That's going to be the main part of the Christmas story that we're going to read. And as I always like to say, as Scripture tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God remains forever. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand. Let's sing our preparatory hymn, O Little...
choir performance that is next Sunday, right? So any of the uh, adults who are helping or the kids who are going to practice can head out with Yvette. And so there's a good plug right there for our kids Christmas choir. Be here next Sunday and that will be a significant part of our service. And then the next week is our adult choir, and they will also, uh, likewise, then that's going to be a significant part of our service then in two weeks. Can you believe that Christmas is already flying by? Is it just me? It is just me? No, I all agree. Okay, a few of you. It's like, wow, coming up quick. We sang about several elements of the Christmas story already today, and I know she's, I know she's already out of here, but I'm going to tell you, at this point, it's, it's not even unique anymore. I know God leads Yvette in picking the songs because of how often, there's a lot of times we don't even, you know, a lot of times we talk about the songs, but there's so many times that we end up singing when we don't. And we end up still singing about the exact, we sing about the exact things that are going to be highlighted in a message. And it's, it's uncanny this time. We, we sang uh, about, just sang about Bethlehem. And one, one, we're going to talk about four major uh, subjects, I guess you could say. Two of them are people. Uh, and uh, then one is a town. That's Bethlehem. And we're going to talk about Bethlehem in here. Did you notice that we ended on a verse that was talking about Bethlehem? Then we went right into that. And then also the, the name Jesus, okay? And even some other names in there. The name Emmanuel. We started, had that song, you know, Emmanuel at the beginning of our service. And then our choir song was singing, you know, incorporating different songs that talk about the importance of the name of Jesus. And we're going to look at them, what I think is an, an interesting direction to come at Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem and the name Jesus also with Emmanuel. And it's going to be a lot of it from Matthew chapter 1, but we are going to then go over to, to Luke. I think it's chapter 1, or I hope it's not chapter 2. I said it earlier. Yeah, it's going to be actually Luke. Such a long chapter. Yeah, still Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is a long chapter. 
But we're going to do it, actually, from an, what's going to be a little different perspective. I don't know if you've ever had in covering Christmas texts, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29 come in. And if you can get over there in, in your Bible, it's basically you're trying to save three spots. Usually when I do that, I'll try to put verses up on the screen, but we're not, not doing that this time, so you're just going to have to jump around. And once again, in your pew Bible, 1 Corinthians is on page 1013. So the Matthew text is 849, the Corinthians text is 1013, and the Luke text is going to be page 904 in your pew Bible. Hear what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are debased, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. This is a text talking about how God uses very uncommon things, very, or very, very common things, very plain things, uses terms like uh, foolish things, weak things, things that the world would put to shame, things which are even despised, base things, and these are the things he's going to use to do great things, to do incredible things. And I would submit to you that there are four things in the Christmas story that fit this description. One of them's Joseph. The other, and I'll explain it, all these. The other is the name Jesus. The other is the town of Bethlehem. And then the fourth one we'll look at, and you can find more in, in the Christmas story. We're going to look at four. And the other is Mary herself. So if you would now, you can keep your ribbon or whatever else there in that 1 Corinthians text in case we jump back there later. In fact, I know I'm going to want to bring up verse 26 again. But with that, look over at the book of Matthew from our scripture reading from earlier. We primarily want to look at what happened with Joseph between verses 19 and 20, and then we're going to kind of bring in verses 24 and 25. And what we see in Joseph is this. God uses a good man to do a great thing. All right? God uses a good man to do a great thing. Now, I believe that everybody in this room, and anybody who'd go online later and listen to this sermon, watch this sermon, I believe that we all want to be good people, right? We want to be good people. But, that, but do we want to do great things? See, what we see is that God, God takes Joseph, who is, is a good man, but he takes him and he does a great thing. I'll explain it this way. Look at verses 8, well, verse 19 and then into 20. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. We see that he is a just man. And so what I used to, to say that, we, we might, if we talked about somebody as being a just man, we were a just person, we would probably say they're, they're a good person, right? We usually wouldn't say just. We'd say they're a good person. So that's basically what's being said here of Joseph. He, he was a good man. And he was seeking to do a good thing. But God didn't want to do just a good thing with Joseph. God wanted to do a great thing with Joseph. And so the angle I'm taking with this that I believe God led me to take that benefit you and benefit myself as well is sometimes we're just setting out to just be good people, but God wants us to not only be good people, he wants to do great things in our lives and through us. 
He's a just man. He's a good man. And he's seeking to do a good thing. The good thing here is not wanting to make a public example of her. He minded to put her away secretly. He's got to be upset, right? I mean, let, let's realize what happened here. He was betrothed. They were going to get married. And now she's come up pregnant. And the worldly thing to do would be to make a spectacle of her, wouldn't it? He's hurting. Old saying, hurting people hurt people. He's hurting on the inside, and, and, a, and a lesser person would make a spectacle of her. But he's a good man, and he, even though at this point he's hurting because she's come up pregnant, he still wants to do the good thing and the right thing. But God doesn't leave him to do that, does he? God takes him so far as to do an incredible thing, a great thing. And instead, he does that great thing. We see in verse 20 that, it says that Joseph is then visited by an angel of the Lord in a dream. And the angel says to Joseph in the dream, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to, take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is born of the Holy Spirit. Instead of just doing the good thing, which, yeah, you should do the good thing, but God wants to a lot of times do the great thing. And I would submit to you as Christians, sometimes we stop at the good thing when God wants to do the great thing. The great thing here, the amazing thing for Joseph to do is to take her as his wife, isn't it? That's the really amazing thing. That's the incredible thing. That's the great thing. Instead, he does a great thing when he takes Mary as his wife. But in order to do that great thing, he has to, first of all, overcome something that stops a lot of us. He has to overcome his fear. He has to overcome the fear of what other people are going to say, of how he's going to look. You notice there that it says in the middle of that, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Now, it's not do not be afraid that the angel is appearing to you in the dream. It's do not be afraid to do what? Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why would he be afraid? Because he might come under ridicule. That's why he might be afraid. So what he did was he gets past his fear and he ends up Trust in the Lord and relying on God. And the way we know that is because he very simply does what God tells him to do. There's a lot of things in Scripture that God tells us to do that we don't do because we're afraid, right? We're afraid. And we sit in the realm of being good people, which is a good thing. And the Lord will work and say, look and say, all right, you're a good person. But God doesn't just want you to be a good person. He wants you to be a good person who does great things. I love the role that the Holy Spirit is. He names this is something that the Holy Spirit's doing, Joseph. And you need to get on board with what the Holy Spirit is doing. And then we jump down to verses 24 and 25. It says, then Joseph, waking up from the dream, that's being aroused from the dream, he wakes up. He did as the Lord commanded him. Very simply, in order for a good man to do a great thing, he needed to get past his fear and do what the Lord commanded him to do. Part of what the Lord commanded him to do was not only to marry, 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 which he does, and that's the great thing that he does. Where'd the Christmas story go from there if he doesn't? But he does. But also, he was told something very specific. He was told what they were supposed to name the child. So it goes on, it says that Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And you notice how I took out the angel part there, because when he was doing what the angel commanded him, he knew he was doing what the Lord was commanding him through the angel. He did what the, Lord, what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him, he took to him his wife, he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. That's the second thing. The first thing is, is the first thing first is, is the person, Joseph, that God used a good man to do great things. But also is this name Jesus. This name Jesus. And in terms of the name Jesus, 
And I just love the fact that so many of the songs we sang this morning highlighted Jesus' name. What we see in the name Jesus is also an example of what we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because in the name Jesus, God uses a common name for uncommon accomplishments. Explain it to you this way. Jesus, and you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read a little bit of text and then then I'll tell you. We want to look here, verses 21 through 23. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. What kind of gets lost sometimes in the story is that Jesus is the common name. Well, maybe we say, yeah, the common form of the name Joshua, which is also Yeshua. In Hebrew, Joshua is Yeshua. And Yeshua means Yahweh saves. And when he's naming him Jesus, what this is, is this is the common form of that name. It's a common name at this point. It's not a special name. It's very common. He's he's giving him a common name, but he's giving him a common name that's going to be used for uncommon accomplishments. Think about this. That common form of the name Joshua, the name Yeshua, that common form changed the world. That common name, a name that was common in their day, changed the world. God would use a seemingly common child, seemingly, with a seemingly common name like Jesus to fulfill the words of the prophets here. This is very important. You will call him named Jesus because he's going to be the fulfillment. You see right there in verse 22, he's going to be the fulfillment of what the prophets have said. Now, what the prophets have said is no common thing. What the prophets have said is a big deal. And this is named twice here, two real sides of this. One part of it is that he will, at the end of verse 21, he will save his people from their sins. This may be a common name, but it was directing us to something that was highly uncommon. He would make the most uncommon of accomplishments, to save his people from their sins. Also, within this naming here, you see that it's connected with the name Emmanuel. So the name Jesus connects to Yeshua, which means what? Yahweh saves. But also, then, that is a fulfillment that Yahweh will save his people through this individual who seems like a very common child with a very common name, but he will also be fulfilling the prophecy which says, and it's in italics there in a lot of your Bibles because it's a quote from the Old Testament, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, what does it say? Say it out loud because it's fun. God with us. See, names had a little bit more meaning in these biblical times right here. It, Jesus is a very common name. To us, it's not common at all, right? But it's a very common name. In some cultures, it's a very common name. But he'd take that common name and do some uncommon things. He would save his people from their sins and be the embodiment of God. The God of the universe in physical form, Emmanuel, God with us. And like we're sharing, we talked about Joseph and we said that God, yes, he wants us to be good people. But he doesn't want us to stop at being good people. He wants to accomplish great things in our lives. Also, 
A lot of us feel like we're common folks. We don't think we're all that special, you know. We're not famous. Remember back to the verse, remember that those verses before? You're not, you're not famous, especially well-known, just a common person, right? But this is what God does. God takes what is common and he does uncommon things. And he's showing it, showing us that, not only in Joseph, but he's showing us that in something as common as a name. Jesus was a common name, but what he would accomplish, saving his people from their sins and being the embodiment of God with us was an uncommon accomplishment by far. Now, kind of along those same lines comes, this is the third one, the third point in really showing how what was talked about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, how God uses the common things, the weak things, the things that the world doesn't think are a big deal or important. He takes those things and does amazing things, does great things, does uncommon things. Now we take the town of Bethlehem. And that's where you go over into uh, chapter 2, by the way. And we're kind of doing half of the, the three wise men, the three kings from the east story, because we're really focusing here on the Bethlehem part. And that's why we, we, we included it in our scripture reading, but I want to kind of look again here. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in where? Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from, the, came from the east, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Who are they looking for? They're looking for a king, right? So where'd they go? They went to the capital. They go to the palace. They go to Jerusalem. They didn't go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem's a small town. Bethlehem's a small town six mile, about six miles south of Jerusalem. They knew Jerusalem. That's where you expect a king to be, right? But that's the way God works. Because he's going to take the thing you don't expect. And he's going to do something amazing. In the town of Bethlehem, God makes a small town... God takes a small town and makes a big difference. A lot of times we think, oh, hey, I'm just a regular guy, I'm just a regular gal, regular person. But that doesn't mean God can't do un uncommon and amazing things with you. We think, I try to be a good person. That doesn't mean God can't go further and do great things with you. And for a lot of us, we say, you know, hey, uh, I'm not a big deal. In the big picture of things in this world, I'm kind of small. And if we thought otherwise, that'd be kind of prideful, right? We could look at ourselves, we can understand, hey, it's a big world out there, and, you know, I'm not top of the list. We may feel like we're small, just like probably everybody who lived in Bethlehem knew they lived in a small town. The big town was Jerusalem. But we see in Bethlehem that God takes a small town and he makes a big difference. The eastern kings naturally went to the capital. They went to Jerusalem, it says there in verse 2, to seek a king. But that king was not in Jerusalem. The king they found, Herod, was the, what the world thought was a king. He's in the big town. He's in the capital, in the, in the palace. But he wasn't the king of kings. He wasn't the real king. The real king was in the little town of Bethlehem. Once again, God taking something small and making a big difference. It says in verses 4 through 6, said, Then he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, and he inquired of them where the, chi where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Nobody would expect anything to come out of Bethlehem. Then when later on Jesus is 
they go to Nazareth where they're from, you know, where they lived. And what do you find out? Later it even said, what good comes out of Nazareth? It said out of script, people ask that. What good comes out of Nazareth? What big comes out of Bethlehem? If something big's going to happen, if there's going to be a king of kings, he's going to be in Jerusalem. But that's just the way God works. We may feel small in the big picture, but the reality is that's what God wants to do. He wants to take the little guy, the little gal, and he wants to do big things. And if you're like, like me and you say, hey, you know, I, I'm not the preacher of a mega church. What's God going to do with me, right? You say, you know, I just, I just do small things. I don't do big things. God is going to take the small people of this world, just like he took small Bethlehem. And that's who he wants to use to make a big difference. Never think that you are too small for God to use you to make a big difference. Do you get the theme here, folks? Are you getting it? Because that's the way God works. We'd have naturally thought God would put the king of kings in Jerusalem. But he's going to do it in Bethlehem. And he's going to say, yeah, you think Bethlehem, you're small. But what does it say here? But you are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a true ruler. I put the true part in there. A ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Not Herod. So once again, I wanna, I'm going to bring back here for a second 1 Corinthians 1.26. I'm not going to read all the scriptures again. All those scriptures talk about these things of the world, the weak things and the despised things and the debased things and all this. But I want to make sure that as we close and we go to our fourth person in this sense, fourth thing, who is Mary, that we are personalizing this because we're supposed to. Says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For you see your calling, brethren. He's talking to Christians here. So he says, You see your calling, brethren. That not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the things which are mighty. I truly believe that these four examples from the Christmas story are powerful examples of how God wants to glorify himself in the things the world thinks are small and exceed all expectations. And what I hope we all come out of here with is that the world's expectations for us or even our own expectations for us or other people's expectations for us do not matter to us nearly as much as God's expectation of what he can do with little old me, right? The last little old me is a lowly maidservant by the name of Mary. Chapter 1 is a long chapter. got 80 verses in that chapter. And Mary is all over in there. This is the big Mary chapter right there, Luke chapter 1. But I want to focus on the song of Mary because she real, she, look at how she views herself, but how she views what God can do through her. We said that first, Joseph, well, you can, we know we can just be good, but with God we can do great things. We know with See that name, Jesus, that we may be common, but with God we can make uncommon accomplishments. We know with the Bethlehem example that we may feel small, but with God we can make a big difference. Well, with Mary, you know what? God uses a lowly maidservant to magnify himself. Of all the power brokers in the world at that time, and before, and since, and every name in the Bible... Nobody who knew Mary would have thought that she was going to be the one to magnify God more than almost all of them, right? If you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 46, Mary's realized now what God's going to do with little old her. She calls herself a lowly maidservant. 
But she realized that in a lowly maid servant, God will mag- is magnifying himself. By the way, this is it's off, often called, this song is called the Magnificat. Because it's about God showing how God magnifies himself in this lowly maidservant. Verse 46 in Luke chapter 1. It says the last section of scripture will be in today. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Why? Because she's a big deal in the world? Because she got a lot of money? Because she's got a lot of friends? Because she's really popular? No. No. No, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. All right? A young girl in a world where young girls didn't have a lot of power. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, and for behold, henceforth, all generation will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. And then listen to how, listen to this discussion she has right there, and, and see the subject matter we've been talking about, and see that this is an example of also what's said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He has, shown with his, he has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted instead the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. The proud think they're all that. In the own, it says, in the, the proud in the imagination of their hearts. What they, how that great that they think they are. The imagination of their hearts, it says he has scattered them. Those who believe they are mighty with their thrones, he has put down. This is verse 52. And instead he exalts the lowly. The rich who can get whatever they want, God sends them away empty. And he fills the hungry with good things. And all of this is different ways of her saying, what an incredible God that he would take this lowly maidservant and he would magnify himself in the eyes of the world. Mary is a young woman of no noble lineage, But she now sees that God uses those the world considers simple or small or common or lowly to magnify himself to accomplish his great purpose on earth. Neither of the people that we've looked at in in the Christmas story today were of great reputation, but God did great things with them. The name given to Christ, that name Jesus, that now so resonates in our hearts and changed the world, was as common as the town of Bethlehem that he was born in. But God is all about using what the world considers common to accomplish uncommon and exponentially great things. Let us never think that something great is going to happen because we're great. Let us think that something great is going to happen because our God is great. Let our expectations never be limited to what the world sees, what the world expects, what other people expect. Let it be unlimited in what God expects that he can do. If he can use Joseph and he can use Mary... If he can use a simple name and he can use a simple town to initiate one of the greatest stories ever told and change the world forever and bring salvation to humanity, then he can use simple old you and me as well. A lot of times people come to the church and they think, oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy of God. Well, we got a message for you. It's not about you being worthy. It's about 
God being worthy of you. And God is worthy. God is great. And if we focus ourselves on him, the things that he can do in our lives are exponentially incredible. No matter where we come from, what our name is, or who we are. God is great, and that's why we gather to sing about him. That's why we stand and close to sing about him. That's why we hear the call to be faithful. When we sing this song, we sing, Oh, come all ye faithful. It's kind of an invitation. And it's saying, you know what? I'm faithful to God because he takes lowly me, and through his son, Jesus Christ, he does great things in my life, and he does great things through my life. I hope this has been a fun way to kick off Christmas for you. Maybe a little different take on the Christmas story. Maybe we got three other weird takes coming up. That'll be fun because God likes to take the weird and magnify himself as well. I'm living proof. Let's stand. Let's sing. Oh, come, all ye faithful. If you got any reason to come down today...